you to uh, tell us your stories um, leading up to the early part of this year and then how COVID-19 has affected your businesses since it has devastated the economy and in many instances devastated hospitality in this, in this country. And after about 40 minutes, um, we'll see if there are any questions. Um, please leave your questions in, in the chat box. And, um, and then we have time at the end for Nisha and Alison to address those. Okay, over to you, Alison. Thank you very much, Jackie. Uh, and thank you for joining us. Um, and you're completely right, Jackie. Uh, we did meet on the set of a television program. Uh, it was a television about, uh, a program about uh, artisan food. And uh, as soon as we met, we realized that we would really get on. So we worked really hard all day. And then in the evening, we would flop down over food and uh, we would talk and talk. And uh, we soon realized that although we came from very different backgrounds in many ways. Well, some real similarities in our backgrounds. Uh, we actually shared lots and lots of things. And so it was just fantastic to meet Nisha and, and it's been a great pleasure ever since knowing her. Um, we spent a lot of time during that um, television program looking at Harold McGee's book on cooking because although we knew quite a lot about some of the things, we didn't know a huge amount about some of the technicalities. So we were learning every evening and then judging the following day. So it was a bit of a scandal actually. Um, but what I'd like to do really today is to talk to Nisha about her fantastic restaurant empire. Uh, and, but seriously about how she has weathered the pandemic, because it's something that is uh, preoccupying everybody. Everybody in hospitality uh, is having such a, a challenging time. And I thought that really talking to Nisha about her own work with restaurants would be very interesting for other people. Where are you, Nisha? I can't see you. I can see, I can see oh, you. Oh, can you? Oh, good. There you, you are. Hey, okay, brilliant. Can I speak? Does that help? <laughs> Can okay. you hear me is more important. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to ask you lots of questions mm -hmm. about Mowgli. Um, and one of the th things that I wanted to start on, uh, to start with, was not actually talking to you about the restaurant, but how you came to think about working in food. Because there you were, a young barrister in Liverpool, and you must have had in the back of your mind some idea about going into hospitality, but where did that come from? How did it start? It's really interesting because I, A, I wasn't young and I'm very proud of the fact that I wasn't very young when I started this. So I'm now 49, so I was 43 when, when I started Mowgli. And there are so many wonderful things about coming to this kind of a business later. But the truth is, Alison, and, and a lot of this, I think, you know, I will touch upon the, the culture that I come from, the fact that I'm a woman, all of those things. Um, hospitality was never something that I thought about going into. In, in my, so this was nine, six years ago. Um, and in those days, you know, the images that you had of hospitality um, were kind of the Gordon Ramsay television programs. It was not a place for anyone that was not a psychopath, it would appear to me. <laughs> you know, it was the most alarming, alarming um, industry. So I was, a, I was a, a child protection barrister, so lots of what I did was, was um, primarily child abuse, but also a lot of domestic violence. And all of those facets of perpetrators of domestic violence were what I was seeing writ large on the screen and being celebrated in kitchens up and down the country. So it was never something I wanted to go into. What I did have, however, and I think this is true of many, many immigrants, is a burning passion to keep alive the recipes of my ancestors. Um, the truth is that many of the Indians that came over when my parents did in the 1960s, late 50s, the very fact that they could afford a flight ticket meant they could afford chefs back home. And, and so these, these skills and these formulas were, I felt, dying. They were very tenacious, you know, they were held onto by tendrils, really. 
Um, and I saw that with the second generation, like me and my, my brother's a doctor, I grew up to be a barrister. We were not trained to go to the kitchen. That was something of an indignity. Um, we were not trained to be chefs, you know, to be a restaurateur. Um, it's, a, it's a dreadful thing, but, you know, in Indian culture, the culture that, that I came from, that was not something to aspire to. In fact, still, my Indian relatives will phone me. They cannot bring themselves to acknowledge that I've given up the bar for restaurants. So they will ring up and say, how are your hotels? Because <laughs> it softens the blow. It's incredible. But do you see how coming from a background like that, and that is why we are so underrepresented. You look at the number of, and I'm not talking about chefs here. We're underrepresented when it comes to head chefs, females, um, but it's it's CEOs, it's restaurant owners, it's founders of these these restaurants that um, that aren't necessarily heirlooms that have come down. My parents, of course, didn't have restaurants. Of course, they didn't. They were doctors. Um, it, you can understand why when we come from the background that we do with the attitudes that pertain there, why it is such a seismic and you know courageous leap really because you are constantly suffering the wrath of um an extended family that think you're crazy for doing it you know just waiting it for it to to fall down and that was my indian family my english family my my friends and relatives who of course they were all doctors and lawyers because that's the social you know because that's what we were um just thought it was a midlife crisis and and that it would end at some point and how could i how could i sacrifice you know the family the truth is every penny i had i invested in starting my own mowgli you know my savings it was a it was um that's the entrepreneurial disease it's like psoriasis i think once it grabs you so it, it was never something i aspired to but i do honestly think with entrepreneurs and i think the world sort of falls into 50 percent entrepreneurs 50 percent content people <laughs> possibly mm -hmm. but for the entrepreneurs amongst us it is something that comes alive and it, uh, and it and it bites and there is nothing you can do you will feel if you haven't tried this this uh, ambition that, that is born if you haven't given birth to it you will have lived a half-life and that's what it's like and, and I felt you know, if I'm physically addicted to the food that I've eaten for 50 years without tiring of it and it was unrepresented on the streets of England, you know, because it's primarily vegan, it's entirely gluten-free, it's not lumps of meat floating in a thick sauce, all of those things about curry that, that mean nothing to most Indians. Um, I thought, well, if, I, if I'm so addicted to it, it might be that there's something in here, there, there might be a market for this. So I very tentatively and humbly and, and in, in the eyes of everyone, foolishly started to try and find a premises for this thing and I was never going to give the bar up because I didn't think Mowgli would take off. So I did both at the same time. So I'd work in court in the day and then in the lunch breaks and in the evenings, I honestly, any, any, I would physically go and knock on restaurateurs doors and ask if I could go and stand in their kitchens pre-COVID. You couldn't imagine it now, could you? But I would go and put an apron and a hard hat on and just stand silently in the corner of a kitchen and work out why they needed you know that much butter and how many pans would you need and how big that hob is and would female chefs need a step etc because I had no idea what it would look like and so that's how I started to chart the waters into into starting Mowgli reluctantly and are you going to let me ask you a question Nisha? I think that's we're done now that's 45 minutes <laughs> <Yes. laughs> I think you're gonna get three three questions in here Alison <laughs> My net, my actual question was going to be um, what you thought the barriers were going to be when you started up the restaurant or started your first one and what they actually turned out to be, whether they were the same thing. Um, my barriers, um, do, you, do you know what's so fas fascinating is that because I, I charted it completely alone, I didn't have a pro forma. There was no playbook that I could look at. I didn't know really any restaurateurs that I could ask how it looks. I was so outside of the restaurant. I'm talking about the owner world. I was in a foodie world because everyone I knew in the way that we connected, you know, everyone I connect with is, is passionate about food. But be because there was no performer, there was no expectation. I actually didn't know. I didn't have any real anxieties about or, or, or any anxieties that I that, that were manifest and I could put my fingers on about what my what the, the hurdles were going to be. Finance is a big one. You know, and we did we we remortgaged everything, all our savings went into this. You know, my Nisha, how did you get your business knowledge? How did you know how to 
do a cash flow? How did you know how much of your savings you were going to have to put into the business? Where did you, you'd never went to business school, you'd been a lawyer. Where did you get that knowledge from? I did, I did a bit of ancillary relief, which is dividing up the assets in a marriage. So I kind of knew how to work out who gets the goldfish and who gets, you know, the, the Porsche or whatever. So I had a rudimentary knowledge of numbers. And I think what's so great about the kind of food that I was bringing, you know, we're not Michelin starred. It's not, it's not about that. Indians wield lentils magnificently and cumin. So I knew this food was frugal. The margins, I can work margins out, the margins were great. So I knew the raw material that I had was, was financially a real goer. Um, what I know as well, and what I'm very good at is knowing how little I know. So I still wouldn't know, and I have no interest in writing a rotor. I have no interest in learning how to work out at all of my till systems. So before I even opened Mowgli, my first Mowgli, I hired a very good general manager who could do all of that. And so, and I think that's that's one of my greatest gifts is realizing that there's a real ceiling to, to my, I know what my, my strengths are, but I absolutely know the areas that I need someone to come in and you know, let's work out a rotor. I tell them how fair I want it to be. I tell them how many hours I want my, my, my staff to work, how I want them to feel the culture. They are the ones that do that kind of thing. So I hired very early and it taught me that, you know, we're six restaurants. And so, yes, I've got, sorry, I've got 11 obviously trading, but you know, I've got another five that I'm in the middle of a build of. So far it's worked. So, so far holding on, you know, being, so I'm the exec chef. I design every dish. I train all my chefs because I train them in this kind, kind of ancient uh, Hindu Ayurvedic way of cooking. It's a very particular way of cooking. Um, so uh, in terms of the people culture, the, the people strategy, that is absolutely me. The culture, it's me. I know what I need to not let go of, but I have a brilliant finance director. You know, and as soon as I could, I took on, in those days, I took on a bookkeeper to just, you know, how, let's get the books completely uh, transparent and fair and so I can really understand them. So I, I very quickly hired in the, the areas. I remember somebody taking me aside quite early and saying, you know, that you're at the stage of life now where you should really only be doing the things that you like you look at the hospitality trade and you look at restaurateurs and so many of them, you know, I had, sorry, the other thing is I had two young children. I had two teenage girls, early teenage girls, you know, and, and I have a husband and, and I really don't want to jeopardize those things. And so it was very, very important that I did do the bits that I like. And is that, is that possible? Is it even possible to do, to have a restaurant and not work a, you know, a 12 swing every night. And in the beginning, I used to, I used to serve food. I used to do the, the most humble jobs. I'd KP and I'd collect plates every night after court. So I knew how it felt to work in Mowgli at that level. And it is absolutely critical that I did that. Um, and then, you know, then I've come to the position where I, I run it um, without having to be in it all the time, which is very, very important. Uh, can you tell me, um... First of all, how did you know how to go about finding a general manager? Did, were you networked in the restaurant world in Liverpool? Where did you find these people? All Honestly, of whom would put, all of whom you wanted to train. Sorry, yeah, what I did, honestly, I would go and I would go into restaurants. I was still working full time as a barrister. I wasn't networked in the restaurant world at all. A complete outsider, I wasn't networked. But what's so wonderful about the restaurant world, it is a, a fantastic sorority fraternity. You knocking on the door of a restaurant or going into a little independent restaurant and saying, I'm thinking of stuff, I've got this food that I want to bring to the market. How do I go about doing that? When people come to me and say that, I burn with excitement for them. There is something that really, with all entrepreneurs, when I hear somebody else's entrepreneurial stories, I get, you know, it could be that they want to stand a candle business or whatever it is your mouth starts to water and that is what you find you know you go cap in hand plaintively going to these I honestly knocked on doors and then you speak to a restaurateur here and a restaurateur there and they happen to know someone that might be moving on from this particular brand that's quite good and he might be available and gave me his number that's how it happened it really is like that it's what, what's so encouraging about it is if I can do it anyone could do it you know that that's the thing I had no knowledge no contacts and I had no shame either in going to you know, my, my colleagues uh, on the high street and just saying, how do I do this? You know, who, 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 who would I speak to to do this? 
The only doors that slammed were the bank doors, actually. <laughs> Can you tell me about the first day that you opened your first Mowgli and whether when you're, you say you've got five in the pipeline now, whether those first days when you open those will be anything like the first day that you had back then? They are very similar. It's very interesting. I'll tell you, I'll tell you why it's interesting. This is the wonder of social media. Before, <laughs> I hope people don't just turn off because I use those two words, but it's, it is... I'm going to ask you a lot about social media later. Yeah. Well, but, but the truth is that that um, golden thread embroiders its way right the way through this story. So when I opened the... By the time I'd opened the first... On the first night, the doors of the first Mowgli, I already had a want of a better word a kind of following so what I did is when I started to think about I came from a background where social media was used to punish an absent parent it was a reprehensible thing we hate it barristers hate Facebook it's just a weapon so I came with that disdain into to, to you know edge towards the business world with that disdain for social media as I started to think about doing Mowgli I put out I started this thing called a Facebook page don't really know much about that and I, I set up a page and said, I'm thinking, this is the menu that I'm thinking of bringing to the market. These are the prices. If I brought that to the market in Liverpool, would anyone come? And I started the conversation. And people, I, what I love about the world, if I go so far, honestly, is there seems to be this seam of women who are about my stage, which is slightly possibly empty nesting. Um, children don't kind of need to say we're, we're at the stage where the next lovely you know ambition is is the menopause really but there are there's this latent energy where we're watching each other so any stories like mine we're watching to see does that work does that not work does that reduce your family life is it possible um to build a business with no, the questions you're asking with no knowledge at all um in that way so people started to respond and to the point where i didn't know what to call the restaurant i had three names so i put three names out to the public and they voted on mowgli um you know i, I gave them mowgli mongoose and rickshaw and they all wanted i actually wanted mongoose they they voted for mowgli and then i and and things like the pricings i asked them you know what would you pay for something with the word cabbage in the title £2.95 or whatever. And I priced it according to, you know, what they reasonably were suggesting. So because it was built so collaboratively, by the time I opened the doors, people came in and they knew Mowgli because they'd named her. They'd, they'd chosen the prices on the dishes. They'd helped me whittle down the dishes. This is the power of social media. And that has just grown. It is still the case that there are a couple of dishes that I had an omelette wrap on the menu, for instance, and it wasn't selling. It really just wasn't selling. It's a delicious thing. It's called a cutty roll. So I put it out to social media, you know, why, why isn't this selling? If it's, if it's not delicious and I'll pull it off, can you tell me? And what the feedback um, was, was that people just don't want to go to a, a restaurant and order something with the word omelette in it. So I changed the name to the catty wrap and suddenly the sales went out, you know, off, off, off the scale. Same with the cabbage dish. You know, I, I used the word cabbage, nobody liked it. So they said, we don't want to order something. And this is all through social media. So I changed it to the Calcutta Tangled Greens suddenly it's one of our best-selling dishes and it's instant and it's you know you are really humble because they don't always give you the answer that you want but I will always listen to them because that's the pound that comes through the door so it's very much as it as it feels now when I open a new restaurant as I will in whatever Cheshire Oaks or Brighton or Bristol it feels as it did on those days where people walk in and they know you and you are accountable as well. It's not just a lovely basking knowledge. It's that you are accountable. You know, we, we, we told you we didn't like, um, you know, this particular aspect of service and it's not changed. And so it, you really constantly are interacting. It's as though you have a, a board and the board, thankfully, is your clients. So it keeps you constantly sharp. I've actually been in a restaurant with you when your, uh, your customers a lot of them feel that they know you and come up and talk to you. And, and in fact, that, that's another question I have for you. If you are so involved in the branding, in the social media, with your customers in a very authentic and genuine way, how, first of all, there are lots of questions actually. One is how on earth you uh, manage to keep your private self intact. Uh, but that's one question. But another question will be uh, to do with the large number of staff that you now have. 
and how they feel about it. I can see how your customers feel about it, mm. but how do you give ownership to the staff when you own it so much yourself? I would always say to the staff, and we get together a lot, and I'm in constant communication because we have fantastic um, internal comms channels where I speak directly to them. And I say that, you know, this is sort of my baby, but she has no, honestly, has no face, has no hands without them. It's not me that serves people. When, when they come in, and this is the beauty of hospitality, and this is, I think, post-COVID, what we appreciate so much is walking into a building and the you know, food has to be, has to be addictive, frankly, addictive. Um, but that smile of greeting, the minute you walk in the door, and that warmth and that feeling of home from home that comes from another human, often 20 years old, these children of mine, and the, the warmth that, that they exude has, it doesn't come from me, I hire them, but it is they that animate Mowgli and they are fully aware. So it would, do you know what I do every, every night? And, and I'm always on social media, I do all the, we don't have marketing, we don't have PR, we don't have anything like that, it is me. Five, you know, probably during the course of this conversation, I'll probably check Twitter and, and respond to something constant. I respond to everything. Every time we get a good tweet in, somebody, you know, people have taken to writing since COVID, have been writing messages on napkins and on the back of bills, messages of encouragement to our young teams. I immediately get onto our comms channel, post it and say, this is the effect you have on the streets of Cardiff. This is what you have done on the streets of Liverpool. It's it's an incredible thing. I remember somebody who, who, a friend of mine, she's got six children and I've only got two. And I thought, my goodness, how, how do you do that? And she said, it's an amazing thing. You know, every time you have one, you think I can't possibly have enough love for that third child. And it grows and it grows. And it is absolutely that, that I feel for this team of 500 people. Your capacity to want to make them feel part of this family, just, it feels as though it is inf actually infinite. And this is this maternal management model that I have, you know, within the business is that, you know, I do feel as though there are very few people that we have parted company with in, you know, in six years with 500 staff, where it's not probably, you know, two where you think, oh, that was a little bit of a sad parting. Other than that, it's a very, very happy place. I was warned before I started in this business, you know, that man managing people is the worst thing. That will be the stone in your shoe. And it has been the biggest joy. And I think that's something we have in common though, Alison, is that, you know, and it sounds trite, sounds trite and it's not said, but you know, we, we really quite like humans. <laughs> they are fascinating. <laughs> and if you can make their lives better, which is what we did as a barrister, that's all you're doing. You as a child psychotherapist, that's what you're doing is, how do we make their lives better? And, and, and you know, you have the opportunity through the school to do that and all the things, you know, the, the things that you do through the school, it's incredible, it's bettering people's lives. And the mo motto for Mogi, what gets me out of bed every day, you know, what is that why? Why have I done this? Why do I keep doing it? It is to enrich lives in the cities that we go to, starting with the lives of our teams. And when that is your guiding star every morning, you get up and think about how do I make the lives of my teams better? That love that will flow in every direction through the business and then from server to customer. And that's what the customer feels when they walk in. So it isn't this kind of narcissistic, I dictate the culture. The culture is actually the whip on my own feet, which is I have to get up and make sure that my teams feel fulfilled, nourished and purposeful. That's my mantra every day, fulfilled, nourished and purposeful. How do I go about doing that? And when you feed them, this warmth exudes and the business flourishes. And it's a, it's been a really lovely, just for us, you know, for me as a, as a, a woman, as a mother, as somebody that just does actually love interacting with humans and absorbing everything that they have to say, it's a really lovely way to run a business. You know, you don't wake up and it's not all about spreadsheets. It's about that. I have an FD who checks the spreadsheets, you know, but for me, it's about that. It's about how do I build this culture every day so that um, these people feel that nourishment. So you have 500 employees. Mm -hmm. That's a lot. Do you know all of their names? No, it's impossible. It's impossible. No, exactly. That was what I was going to say. Yeah. But how, in fact, do you make sure uh, that they are happy and fulfilled and nourished? And what, what, is, what is the structure that you have throughout 
your restaurants? It, I mean, just really the structure. Yes, so that- and it's a really good question because many see many of us have these mantras. And actually, what if, there is no point in me having any kind of a mantra and, or, or any kind of a strategy unless I have a diagnostic tool for it. So, in so my business is built on on and restaurants are built on four pillars, and the pillars are people, product, place, financials. The the pillar that you ask about is the people pillar. How do I know that my culture of enriching lives has been successful? And we have something called contentment assessments. Contentment assessments are where it is really important that we know what every single person, KP, part-time, server, runner, part-time feels when they're working at Mowgli. And so what happens is the general manager will, every month, have something called a coffee chat. It's called a contentment assessment across the table five minutes how are you 10 minutes whatever it is a chat how is it going are you happy if you're not happy what can we do to help and where do you want to end up in Mowgli it's those really simple four questions and out of that comes this abundance of knowledge it's really interesting what they then do is make a note of all of this we also have our people team and our operations team go out and do random contentment assessments because it might be that in fact what's happening is we've got a really cruel general manager somewhere and we're not getting that natural really important so you have to have the scrutiny of people team operations team also going out and doing these contentment assessments what then happens is we collect i I went through i was in london two nights ago and with my ops um director and we were doing a contentment assessment night and we could the, the evidence is all collated by in two independent members so we've got our um our payroll um manager and our training manager who haven't got a vested interest in you know interest then that they so they collate the the evidence and then we go through it so we go through restaurant by restaurant so we do this every month restaurant by month how's john doing who are the rising stars who's unhappy there can you see it's like running a school it's like having it's being a headmaster of a school you can have 1200 pupils and you know who's got problems and who hasn't you know who's content who are those students that want to strive for this and so far it's really worked but your question is a really good one it's very interesting that you think of it as uh, being like the head teacher of a school, because I think that's a, an extremely good analogy. I want to get on to the pandemic in a minute. You've gone mute, Alison. You're mute. You're mute. Alison, you're on mute. You're on mute. You are on mute. I can't hear you now. No. No. Ah, can hear yes. you now. Perfect. Okay, good, good. Okay, sorry. Um, you were talking about four pillars. Um, so you started with the people. What's the second one? Second one is product. And that's okay. food. And how yeah. do we... How do we check this complete consistency? I have an army of super tasters who are independent. Many super tasters are the people that sort of grew up in my household who've been fed by me. We train them so that I cook um, the range of dishes and I, I skew flavors in some of them. And they have to be able to spot there's too much fenugreek in that. The cumin haven't been fried properly. It is to that degree. This army of super tasters go, goes out and they do a report. So that's the, the, the diagnostic tool for product. In terms of place, because I design every single one of the Mowgli's, every light fitting, every rope, every brick matters to me. I have something called Mappers, Mowgli Aesthetic Police. Again, it's another small <laughs> army who go out and they will report on the grout in the toilets, the back of the door, the hooks on. Um, is the, you know, is there dust on the ropes? All of that kind of thing. Is the lighting right? Is the music level right? They will report regularly on that. And then financials, the fourth pillar is financials. And you've got audit, external audit, internal audit. That's the finance department. It's, it's beautiful. It's really beautiful. It makes complete sense. And it's completely, um, you can assess every facet of your business. There is not, you know, I think, having been a barrister and also being a control freak it can't be that I don't know what's under any stone in my business and having a structure like this you can feel it and it's not it's not you know you're checking because you want to clean it or you want to make it better otherwise Mowgli will fail and 500 jobs at least go you know every restaurant we build we create another 60 to 80 jobs 
it's so important and, and, and that's the motive. Enriching lives in the cities we go to, every restaurant we build, we take on another house charity to whom we give over 50,000 pounds a year. It, there is so much that rides on me not messing up that you can't turn your eye from any one of those corners. Okay, so we know that you, you don't want to mess up, but the outside world might mess things up for you. So I want to know, just last January the 2nd, mm -hmm. how did you feel about Mowgli? So euphoric that sometimes I can't sleep. I, as I did as a barrister, I, it's not, I haven't worked a day in my life. As a barrister, if I was in court the next morning, I would skip out of bed and it's the same euphoric because you know January the end of January we had another we were supposed to be building another four or five restaurants I build four restaurants a year that's sort of what I do nationally I haven't got any in London for good reasons thankfully at the moment um so the, I was very very excited about the future and then March came along yes so tell me I think a lot of the people who are listening in on this will be extremely interested to know how you, how you're doing, what's okay. going, uh, how you've had, whether you've pivoted in any way, whether you've carried on doing the same things, how do you feel about, uh, have you survived? And if you have survived, how have you survived? And is there anything you think that other people can learn from that? Um, once you are knee deep in, in a, a business, it, it's hard to learn anything from, from, from what I've done. The way that I've built Mowgli is the way that I have, the way I've managed her finances is the way that I have managed my domestic finances, which is always give yourself headroom. And it's a crazy thing. And I don't know if that's because of my background or because I have been raised and I'm continue to be surrounded by people that think it's going to fail. <laughs> but I always had headroom. She's always, she's always got a real buffer. And so if I can be honest about Mowgli, um, we've been fine because I tell you furlough was such a good thing, but before furlough was announced, we continued to pay, we just knew it would be fine. We continued to pay our teams. Furlough came along, thankfully. We haven't lost a single person from our 500, which is incredible. What it meant is I couldn't then build. It means that you can't, you know, you can't build add value to the business, but that's only the business. The humans remain intact. The brand, in fact, has, it's a crazy thing, but during lockdown, our following increased more than it ever did in any, you know, you know, four or five month period before lockdown. Every day I cooked a recipe with whatever the detritus was in my veg rack and whatever was decomposing in the back of my fridge and posted it on Instagram and you know just you you ask the question about how do you keep your personal life out of social media depends what kind of a personal life you have if it's like mine which is I go from meal to meal to meal I cook my dream and I did live the dream during lockdown is to go out and buy exactly what I need to cook that day prepare that food and then start preparing for the next meal and walk the dogs that's my life and I'm very happy to share that. And what it did was give quite a, a number of people a lot of solace. It was really interesting. I did think the work, the social media world out there was a very wonderfully warm, collaborative place. Um, so what it means is we couldn't build, but we are fine because I'm building again now. We've only got out of 11 restaurants, I've only got three and a half trading card. It closes at six o'clock, which is ridiculous really, but there it is. Um, so I've got two Liverpool restaurants and an Oxford restaurant, which is my only tier one restaurant trading. The others are furloughed. And what I'm saying to my teams is you are safe, you are secure, enjoy the time. Because when the doors open again, I truly believe that people will flock to the high street. People appreciate more than ever now um, what the lights on the high street mean, what restaurants mean. I know, you know, that I know that when they can, they will eat out. Many people have had 80 percent. Um, of their pay and nowhere to spend it. There is this awful truth that there are many people that have also lost their jobs and that's why it's really incumbent or, or risk losing their jobs. And that's why it's really incumbent on us as restaurateurs to be reasonably priced. If you want to be busy and you want to be full, you have to look at your pricing. You just, it, this, is a, this is a journey, you know, we are hand in hand now, consumer and restaurateur, and we have to help out in that way. So I'm very, very mindful of that. I don't put prices up, etc. Um, 
So I'm um, as, as positive, honestly, as I've always been. But I honestly do think that that, again, is an entrepreneurial thing. I think we are, you wouldn't do it otherwise. We are really innate optimists. We are very much, well, many of us are kind of glass half put for people. And I, I just think that people will, again, flock to restaurants as safely as they can. The vaccine, and I think even, you know, the vaccine being heralded makes a difference to people's confidence. Um, so we, we're trading the three restaurants and we're trading well. We're, do, we're doing well and I'm really grateful for that. Do you think the formula you have, and I think it is a formula, I mean, it's a winning formula, uh, with the kind of food that you give to people and the fact that it's the same all the, well, all the way through all of your restaurants, does that keep your costs down enough for you to make money? I'm sorry. I'm I mean, what, the, my, my question is, if you go to many restaurants, you know, the raw ma materials are changing. Um, it, it, when people have had to shut the restaurant very quickly because of the lockdown, they've lost a huge amount of stock. And that's been very difficult for them. If they have to start again, they have to buy huge amounts of stock. All of those things have made life incredibly difficult for some restaurants. What is it about the way that you operate on a practical level that makes it easier for you to shut and open and furlough and not furlough? I don't think it's easier. I think, I tell you what's very interesting and it comes to the point that you raised at the beginning, which is my, my menu uh, it, it is the same. We know, you know, the food, the food doesn't change. People are addicted to certain dishes and, and I will keep giving them those dishes. I might change the odd dish. But that I, I believe in sort of this mantra where people need to be addicted to your food. They then will adopt your restaurant as something that is worthy of their family. And then you have their allegiance. So I'm not going to mess with the dishes to which they're addicted. And I think once you've got that set sort of menu, you it's much easier to pivot and to be nimble. Um, I've got a great operations team. So we 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 have been pretty good at judging when the next, the government haven't completely sprung it on us. You know, you can read between the lines and you kind of know. One of our, you know, requests has been, that, you know, if you're going to shut us down, then at least give us four days. Or if you're going to do it on a Wednesday, let us know on Monday. So it gives us time to wind down. So there's a bit of loss, but the truth is um, we are, you know, a relatively simple menu. And so it, there's not that, we don't hoard lots of stock either. There's very little waste in Mowgli. So it's been quite easy. And in terms of furloughing, you know, I've just got it, you know, we, we worked full time right the way through this, you know, epidemic, M me and um, my ops director and my finance director worked tirelessly nonstop. So, you know, there are three hands to this plow that can ensure that, that that turns around quite quickly. But it is dreadful for many because, you know, if you're not staffed in the way that I am, it's, n it's not easy. It's a, it's a huge amount of work. Tell me, how safe are your restaurants in COVID terms? What is so wonderful about restaurants, and this is what we would say to government, is that they are the safest places. You, that's, it's safer to eat in our restaurants than it is to have people to your house. We have so many layers of scrutiny. We have to have, to be able to operate an internal audit that we hire. So we have food alert that come in and tell us, this is how many sanitizers, this is how often you have to sanitize, this is the way in which you do it. If you don't do it, you won't pass your internal audit. In Liverpool, we have the COVID marshals that come into the restaurants. Now, the COVID marshals interact with us and they are zealous. They're like parking attendants who just got their badges, you know. They come in, I promise you, most nights, and they will check whether we are adhering to the, the, the COVID secure rules. We have the actual police who will come into our restaurants and if they can see somebody that is finishing up their meal or has just finished their meal and are waiting for desserts, we've had the police go up to that table and say, you're not eating anything, you need to leave. You can you see the levels, the strata of scrutiny and then you've got EHO. So you couldn't find it. I, I tell you a statistic that, that is really fascinating. And, and I don't think this is an indictment on, 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 on test and trace or truck and trace as it was, but we have served over 400,000 people since we came out of lockdown. And the number of customers we've had to contact because of a case of COVID that's been reported to us or that we were aware of is zero. 
is actually zero. What was really interesting is that, you know, with my entire sisterhood of um, CEOs and founders, if you speak to any of those, the big brands even, it is at the very most sort of high single digits, the number of people the number of people that have had to be contacted you know we it, it is a terrifying thing for us because when you're you know as founders when your own finances are predicated on something as serious as covid you can't afford to let it slip you know every muscle every sinew is 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 engaged in how do we make our places secure so you they, we are very very and i'm not speaking about me i'm talking about the restaurant the hospitality industry is diligent because our lives depend on it in a way that that few other industries do nisha uh i've just looked at my watch and i think that we're going to have to stop fairly shortly to uh answer any questions that there might be um but i just wondered if you had any thoughts about I mean, it's a huge question really about the restaurant industry going forward after the pandemic how you think in fact you have talked about it a bit you you think that people will come back and but how what advice or what would you share really about how to get people back and how to make them have some confidence in hospitality I honestly, from, from what I can see, because remember, I we have been back in dribs and lurched back, lurched out, lurched back. So when I reopened, or when restaurants reopened, and forget Eat Out to Help Out, which was very kind, but forget that. Once we reopened, restaurants generally, now, geography is a tricky thing. So the centre, central London is a different creature altogether. Where you have restaurants in areas that the workforce are coming in and you are dependent on that. There are real difficulties. I've got one in Birmingham in Grand Central Station. And because nobody's commuting to work anymore, it's it's really difficult. When we did open for the couple of weeks that we were allowed to open, it was really hard because you don't have that kind of workforce commuter upon which we depend. So Central London, put that aside. My restaurants are in northern town, not just northern towns, but they are towns outside of London, Nottingham, Sheffield. Um, we're just opening Bristol. We've got Oxford. You can see they're all over the country. And people did flock back. I think generally people aren't anxious in that way. I think they realise because there is a lot of bad press about us, not bad press, a lot of press about hospitality and how we are COVID secure. And you have COVID security you know, certificates on your windows and they can see what I love about, again, social media. If somebody goes in and sees someone malhandle something or encroach on personal space or your social distance, they're straight on Twitter. There is no greater scrutiny. And so restaurants, are, I, my, my view is, and my experience is, is that, that people are trusting of restaurants. They're possibly less trusting of the tube to get to the restaurant. But in, in these, you know, in the, in the towns in which we operate, where you're, you know, a, a short drive or a walk away from your restaurant, we, we've been busy and restaurants are busy. They're bu you will see that they're busier in Kingston and Barnes than they are in the central London. It's the same yeah. philosophy. And I, I would suggest also that you have kept in touch with all of your customers through social media throughout lockdown and that that's been an extremely useful and clever thing to do. Hourly. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much hourly. Yeah. Because they are the reason that we exist. Without that, them coming through the door and deigning and being kind of them to spend their hard earned uh, you know, pennies with us, we wouldn't exist. So I will never overlook that link. Mm, mm. Well, thank you, my darling. Uh, let's see if there are any questions. Um, I see we have one here from, Me uh, from Mex, Mex Ibrahim. Um, she says, that's very inspiring, Nisha. Uh, and she loves how you talk of your restaurants as having a personality and how you call them she. Um, so she wonders what is particularly female about your restaurants? Is that maternal management model, you know, this nurturing, um, this way that we really believe, honestly, it's like raising children, then that's not an indictment. That's the most wonderful, you know, emotion that you can engage or raising a beloved niece or whatever, which is, I, I look at three things. I look at whether they have people, every decision I make, every person I hire, I look and see whether they have grace, intelligence, 
and the ability to graft. And if they have that, when they fail or when they're, we spot flaws, we can work with them. And it's having that kind of attitude. It's things like, you know, because I did domestic violence, I have a zero tolerance policy on any bullying, on any aggression, on any shouting, on any bravado or swaggering in my kitchens, in fact, across the whole body of staff. So it's a very emotionally hygienic place. I think, you know, it, it, it's, it's wonderful, you know, as we, we as women have a, just a different emotional intelligence and I can only draft Mowgli in the way that I know and it, you walk in and it's not like there's estrogen slopping off the walls but there is just an atmosphere that is the word really is is love <laughs> and I think in business we need to use that word an awful lot more as a woman coming into business you know it's you, you're very conscious that you can't speak like that that you can't speak of ambition you you everything's got to be utterly collaborative you don't sit at the head of tables at meetings you've got to sit next to people and all of that and there are so many complex waters to chart and some of them we need to reclaim some of them we we agree with um and so ev everything everything about the decision making is shackled or is influenced by the fact that i am a woman bound by those this is new territory you know there are what, five six women in the you know FTSE 100 you know there are more Steves are there not or more, more Daves um so this is uncharted water and so I'm very proud of the fact that until there's equality then I will talk about the fact that it's run in a very maternal way in a female way which is just different it's just different not necessarily better yeah and but it's obviously working I mean, it's quite incredible um, how you have expanded so quickly and, and, and how you've obviously kept all these landlords happy, despite the fact that, you know, only well, at the moment, only three out of 11 are trading. Um, mm. I mean, you've obviously got a decent relationship with your landlords. Do, do you know, on, on that point, Jackie, we, we pay our rent even when there is no revenue and that is dreadful and the reason i do that is because i come from this conservative background with a small c where i doff my cap still emotionally and i just think you know remember i wasn't a business person i'm a lay person and if you take on a rent you pay your rent and even though there's a pandemic you don't stop paying your rent so i'm obsequious in that way but the rent question will more than COVID has, kill hospitality unless it's resolved. Our moratorium runs out in, in December. We're not reliant on that. But, you know, out of my 11 restaurants, there are only really about four where we've struck any kind of a deal with the landlord. The bigger landlords won't even talk to restaurateurs about any kind of concession. Um, so people are having a really hard time. People really are. Thankfully, we have the reserves to pay the rent, but that will be the thing that switches the lights out forever on the high street, unless we stop this feudal relationship. That has to stop. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Alison, have you, what else? Um, Beth has asked a question. Da, da, da. Um, how do you maintain the culture that you want without it being diluted? I, well, I, I think we know that, don't we, from what you've been saying. Um, it's, it's being the heart and soul of, of your business, isn't it? Um, I, don't think, um, I don't think your culture could dilute um, with, with you and your teams in charge. It, it, do you know, I also um, write my strategy and I build Mowgli's always thinking in the way that you do with a family that I could be hit by a bus tomorrow and Mowgli needs to march on as strongly as she has. And so it is important to enshrine it. And it's important to use those words, nourished, purposeful, fulfilled. That's how we want people to feel. How are we doing it? Contentment assessments. That's how we do it. The, content, the culture is our people need to feel enriched. They need to feel those three things. How do we do it? Um, and how and are we achieving it? So that's so it's the contentment assessments. It's right and so if I am hit by a bus tomorrow, my head of people <laughs> would be able to say, right, this is what we want them to feel. How are we making them feel that? Those are just sort of infinite values, thankfully. They're not, um, they're not just temporal or zeitgeisty. And so hopefully they will subsist even when I don't. Sounds like it's great to be an employee of yours. Um, uh, 
Thank you, Nisha. Alison, we, we cannot wrap up without asking you how, how you're doing, how, how the School of Artisan Food is doing. Well, thank you. Uh, we're doing pretty well at the moment um, because we provide education and we're allowed to be open uh, to provide education for our accredited courses. So we have a diploma, an advanced diploma in baking, and we're allowed to carry on with that. And we have two years of a university degree in artisan food production with Nottingham Trent University. And so we're allowed to carry on doing that. What we're not allowed to do, uh, both of those are accredited. What we're not allowed to do is to do the short courses, uh, day courses. Um, and that is a problem. I mean, it's very, very difficult, but we have fantastic uh, clients and they are um, mostly deferring the money that they had given us for short courses for December uh, to go on to, you know, next year. The worry is if we're still in a tier three, which is what we are at the moment, we can, we can do the short courses in tier two, but if we're in tier three, the worry is that we'll still not be providing short courses in January and February. And then, you know, we will have to start thinking about pivoting in a different way. But at the moment, we're not even having to do uh, streaming classes. Oh, that's great. That's yeah. A, great to hear that. Um, gosh, well, I think both of you are doing so well at the moment. Um, whether this is because the, you are women at the helm of these businesses. I'm, no, I'm, I know that it's teamwork, I know. But you- It's also luck. I mean, from our point of view, it's luck. I don't think with Nisha it is luck, actually. I think that there's a huge amount of organization and, and I, I think her social media presence is the really, really interesting thing about it too. Um, but also it's the values that go behind the social media presence. I think both Nisha and I have started organizations in which we're extremely interested in the values and ethics behind what we're doing. And so that does kind of prop us up. Um, uh, the practical things, I think in terms of the school, it has really been quite lucky because I think if we'd just been doing short courses, we wouldn't have been able to survive. No. No. There's, there's right one last question here from Chris. Oh, well, there might be another. Um, to Nisha, he'd like to ask about your desire to continue um, expanding. Um, is this because you had contracts in place before COVID, and um, you, you were halfway, I suppose, through to div, uh, opening places, or because you feel that in fact it will support your recovery? out of COVID? Um, I only had one, sorry, that was signed up that I continued to, but that's Bristol. Bristol I signed up pre-COVID. I have signed another two leases in the dark depths of COVID because honestly, I have such faith. <laughs> I just have such faith that we will bounce back. And and all the while, it is honestly, we, we're cre creating jobs. Do you know, I had a really good job that was really well paid and gave me a lot of joy. So unless my reason for doing this job is better, I should just go back to the bar. And it is a wonderful thing to create something that gives 80 jobs where you pay good taxes, where you can charitably give. You, you sleep the peace of a happy laborer when you do that. And so, Chris, I will keep building because it's the right thing to do. And not blithely either, you know, we, we, it, of course, that, that's an expensive thing, you know, a Mowgli costs X hundred thousands of pounds. But I also, combined with that, it's my view on the industry and it's my view on, on um, recovery. I think hospitality, if people eat out when they can at places that are reasonably priced, and we need to do that, I think recovery will bounce back and people will cherish the high street in the way that they never have. This, this will be a real resurgence, I think, you know, once, once we can, once the vaccine kicks in, once people can eat out, I'm finding they do. And so I build on that hope. You're also ambitious. And I just want to say that it's all right for women to be ambitious. In fact, it's brilliant. Absolutely. Yeah, I really still struggle with that. I find that really still. I'm just telling you, and you can scold me later. I find that 
still embarrassing and still because it is a that's a crazy thing women are not supposed to speak like that <laughs> not supposed to use words I like know, that. that's why i do that's why i do yes <laughs> yeah. not just cats amongst pigeons i'm thinking <laughs> But it's really true. I, I, I really find that really hard. I'll tell you what the word I prefer is, and I think women can use this word, is passionate. I am absolutely passionate to the point that my hands are sweating talking about it, about that thing, about yes. growing some, gosh, look at this. I mean, it could be courgettes in the summer, but I'm equally passionate about that. Um, and so ambition, I, you know, I've got a way to go to understand that word and, and whether that's me and whether that's okay. You know, because I'm completely okay because you're doing such a wonderful thing. You are, and and what's been, I think, really lovely this evening um, is noting noticing this great relationship that you two have. You obviously, as Alison said right at the beginning, you obviously get on very well. You understand each other very well, and um, and it's been absolutely charming to see you bouncing off each other this evening so i think we have to wrap it up now but um a heartfelt thanks from lde london for uh for being with us nisha and alison this evening and for all our our guests who joined and i'm sure are going away with a smile on their faces this evening so good luck with it all and keep going thank you very much thank you bye bye, Lots thank of love you. To you. bye, -bye. Bye.